Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Tuesday, March 8th. Here's what we're talking about tonight. President Biden raises the stakes on Russia nearly two weeks into its war on Ukraine. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. How much will the ban help shorten this war? And where will the U.S. replace those supplies from Russia? Thousands of Ukrainian civilians are making their way out of the country, but hundreds of thousands remain trapped without electricity. We'll hear what the United Nations is doing to get Ukrainians to safety and how you can help their efforts. Plus, today is International Women's Day, but it's not just a day for women. You'll see how people around the world use this occasion to call for more reforms and hear about the growing threats against women in positions of power. So we're nearly two weeks into Russia's attack on Ukraine, and the Biden administration announced another effort to put economic pressure on Vladimir Putin. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. Now, this move is not without consequences for the American people. President Biden said this ban would probably make gas prices even higher. We will dig into that in just a moment. For now, let's focus on this pressure campaign. As you heard, President Biden called energy the main artery of the Russian economy. Russia is among the world's biggest energy producers. The U.S. gets a bit of its energy supplies there, but not nearly as much as Europe does which may explain why more countries have not taken this step. European allies are very reliant on Russian energy, so they're not participating. The UK says it will also ban Russian energy, but not right away. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced plans to phase out these supplies by the end of the year. Without the support of key allies, how will this latest move by the Biden administration work? And how much will consumers feel it? Let's begin tonight with NBC's chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, joining us from the White House. And Peter, I wonder what your sense is of the reaction to President Biden's remarks, especially because he's been getting kind of mixed reactions from both parties as to the various measures that the nation is taking compared to what we perhaps could be doing. Yeah, Joshua, certainly this didn't happen in a vacuum here. The president wasn't acting on his own intentionally. He was being pressured by lawmakers from both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill over the course of the last several weeks. Nancy Pelosi last week saying, do it, ban Russian oil. The most powerful Democrat on Capitol Hill making that point does put a lot of pressure on the White House. So ultimately, the president seeing that legislation now making its way through Congress knew that he had to act. And we were told that behind the scenes, some of the president's economic advisors even reached out to Democrats on Capitol the Hill asking for a little space to make this announcement today. But we did see a little bit of a pivot in terms of the president's uh, messaging, the way he is delivering this statement today, again, trying to pin the blame on Vladimir Putin. The president describing it as Putin's war, saying this was going to strike at the heart of Putin's war machine, and also describing them as Putin's price hikes. And that was by design, according to people familiar with the internal deliberations. The messaging was even uh, poll tested by the White House here in an effort to demonstrate empathy as it relates to the economic uh, crisis, the economic concerns that regular Americans are feeling to make sure there was a message delivered to those oil companies so that they wouldn't try to gouge Americans right now with prices already at an all-time high and to really as best they could put this blame on Vladimir Putin. The president, though, Joshua, today himself acknowledged there's only so much that the U.S. can do on this issue. With regard to what the U.S. can do, this is one of those areas where the U.S. policy on trying to stop this war differs from the policy of some of America's European allies. You heard the president today, Peter, talk about how he's tried really hard to have all these countries have a unified response, but everyone is not, perhaps because they're not able, everyone is not jumping to divest themselves of Russian energy supplies right away. How is that working? 
Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, the president wanted to be doing this side by side with the European allies from the very start. And as it relates to the sanctions, the European allies, NATO allies, and the U.S. have been in step the entire way. But on this one, there was a real chasm, a difference between the sides, especially because the United States, as you noted in the introduction of this conversation, they get about, the U.S. gets about 8% of its imports in the form of Russian oil. Compare that to Europe, where the number is closer to 27%. The U.K. today saying they're going to phase it out by the end of this year. Uh, we heard from Boris Johnson saying they recognize the need to become more energy independent, but they couldn't do it overnight. But Germany, and we heard from Chancellor Scholz on this, the president spoke to him and Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron of France just yesterday. Scholz, even ahead of that conversation, uh, made it very clear that this wasn't possible for the Germans right now. They just have too much dependence on Russian oil. And Peter, with regard to what else might come out of Washington, there's this aid package that has been growing as it's gone through Congress. Last week we were talking about it, it was about $6.4 billion, then it grew to $10 billion over the weekend, it was $12 billion this morning, latest word looks like $14 billion, and both the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell both seem to support this, although the exact details are still kind of being ironed out. Where does that go from here? Yeah, that's right. Well, right now, the president uh, and White House officials have been pushing lawmakers to move ahead with this as soon as possible. But the fact that the number, its price tag, has, has swollen so dramatically really demonstrates the growing uh, opinion of Americans that the U.S. has to do more in this situation. We've seen the president's approval ratings tick up a bit. And while a lot of Americans are still dissatisfied with his handling of the situation between Russia and Ukraine, his numbers on that issue have certainly gone up. They are shy of 50 percent, but higher than his overall approval rating. So the president is trying to lead on this issue to continue to send humanitarian and military aid. And as it relates to that military aid, there are some late developments that you'll be talking about over the course of this evening. Poland today, Joshua, made this announcement that they were willing to deliver their Soviet-era fighter jets, their MiGs, to the U.S., to a U.S. base in Germany, ultimately, to be delivered to Ukraine. But that caught uh, American officials at the Pentagon and State Department and here at the White House entirely off guard. They say there had been no coordination on that. It was their expectation, their position that Ukraine could receive those jets directly from Poland right now. From John Kirby, the press secretary of the Pentagon here, he says uh, there are serious concerns about that happening. It could trigger a wider war, and it's simply, in his words, not tenable. Joshua. Yeah, Peter, when, the, when Poland made that announcement today, I, that kind of caught me off guard. And also the response from some U.S. officials kind of made right. it clear that that might need a little bit more ironing out. But we will see where that ends up. Thank you, Peter. Much appreciated. That's NBC's chief Thank White you. House correspondent, Peter Alexander, starting us off tonight. Now, as we mentioned, and as Peter said, the U.S. gets just a fraction of its oil from Russia. How small a fraction? Well, check out these numbers from the Energy Information Administration. That's part of the federal government. As of late last year, the U.S. imported almost 600 million barrels of oil per day from Russia. Now, that means roughly 8 percent, as you can see here, roughly 8 percent of America's imported oil came from Russia. The vast majority of the imports, just over half, come from Canada. Now, 8 percent may not sound like much, but it could still increase U.S. gas prices. And on top of that, oil is a global commodity, so losing any Russian supplies can change what other countries will pay to replace those barrels. Let's continue now with Dan Dicker. He's an expert in energy markets and the author of Turning Oil Green. Mr. Dicker, good to have you back with us. Welcome. Thanks, Josh. Could I just start, before we get into the, the math of, of these latest measures, could I just start with one of the things the president said tonight, where he described oil and energy as the main artery of the Russian economy. I feel like a lot of people in the United States have been tearing their hair out over the U.S. response because they feel like all of this economic pressure is not enough to really hit Vladimir Putin where it hurts to the point of stopping this war. Do you agree with the president's characterization that energy is the main artery of the economy, is the strongest point we can choke right now to try to put pressure on Vladimir Putin? I do. Uh, Russia is uh, very much a petrostate. I mean, not in the way that Saudi Arabia is, but uh, not that far off. Uh, more than 40 percent of their revenues are tied to oil and gas. That's an enormous amount compared, for example, to the United States, where it's under 13 percent. 
Um, this is really um, the toughest uh, action that the White House could possibly take in order to hurt uh, Vladimir Putin exactly where it counts. Uh, the Russian economy doesn't manufacture much. What they have is they have natural resources, oil, gas, uh, coal, uh, zinc, iron, wheat. Commodities is their main business. And when you strike at oil and gas, you're really striking at the heart of the Russian economy. We were just showing the national averages for a gallon of regular gas, according to AAA's gas gauge. The current national average is 4.17 a gallon. It was 10 cents lower yesterday. It was about 40, about 56 cents lower last week. What do you make about how, of how this spiked so quickly? What's behind this rapid increase in gas prices? Is it just the war in Ukraine? Is it U.S. policy? What's what are the biggest factors? Well, it's all, it all kind of filters in. And um, I would, still, of course, you know, oil and gas were on their way on the rise even before the Ukraine uh, dust up began. Uh, we had seen oil prices from the $45 area at the start of, or at least at the end of 2020. And as the pandemic ended, you know, we had this huge kind of pent up demand going to the oil markets and really not a lot of people producers, both here in the United States or outside the United States, who could respond to it. So oil had already been really close to $90 even before Ukraine started. And now with obviously the threats of so much curtailment of what little supply is out there, um, that sort of breeds the kind of panic that you see. And you get these very, very, very fast, violent moves upward, both in the prices of oil and gasoline. I wonder where else you think we might see more impacts from this and perhaps more resiliency. These products that we're gonna put on the screen are all affected by the cost of some of the commodities that come out of Russia. This oil ban could affect obviously the price of fuel, but even things like dairy products or makeup or medicines or furniture or cars or clothing could all be affected by this Russian oil ban. Does this mean that we should expect for just prices of everything in general? to get more expensive, or are there certain parts of the economy that might be more resilient than others? Yeah, Joshua, I think you hit that on the head. I mean, we have a tremendous inflationary problem, and there's nothing that, I mean, you can sit, it would, it would, whatever room you're sitting in, you could look around and you couldn't spot five or six things that don't have some basis in terms of their manufacture in fossil fuels. Uh, people don't really realize that, but plastics, glass, um, aluminum, uh, you could go on and on, uh, medicines, whatever it takes to power anything. Um, your phone, you couldn't, you couldn't build a phone without uh, fossil fuels, rubber, all sorts of synthetics, clothing, it goes on and on. So when you are really making a, a fight and uh, forcing the prices of fossil fuels higher, you're going to really accelerate and um, and and uh, make this inflationary reaction to natural resources that much worse. So we're not only going to feel pain at the pumps, we're going to feel pain pretty much uh, down the line of consumer goods. We have heard from some of you about what these rising prices mean for you. Cynthia from Pennsylvania emailed us about her situation. Cynthia writes, I am a full-time personal shopper and grocery delivery worker in Pennsylvania. I have to fill up my gas tank three times per week, so these insane gas prices are taking a huge chunk out of my income. If they continue to rise, I may soon be forced to cut back on my grocery budget and eat a steady diet of ramen noodles and Vienna sausages. I pray it doesn't get that bad. Cynthia, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. And Dan, before we go, for folks like Cynthia who are wondering how much leverage the president's new measures will have, how impactful do you think those could be? Not just in terms of getting rid of Russian energy supplies in the U.S., but also his call to oil producers today in that same speech saying, you have more opportunities for oil explore exploration in the U.S., permits that already exist, and this is not a time to gouge customers at the pump. They're dealing with enough. Yeah, and I think that um, oil companies have proven themselves, at least in this case, to be very responsive to Ukraine. They don't get a lot of credit for it. Um, BP abandoned 25 billion of assets in Russia. Exxon has dropped its Sokolin gas project. Um, Total has walked away from projects. 
um, in Russia. There's been a lot, you know, no credit given to oil and gas companies. I know they are a generalized villain in the world, you know, that they they tend to, uh, you know, make enormous profits and, and, and hate the world and hate people, and most people hate them. I would say in this particular case, they've done a, their share, at, at least to begin with, in uh, being part of shutting Russia out uh, from their oil and gas assets. And so um, I don't know if that comment was necessary from the White House at this particular stage. It might have been politically driven, but uh, you know, I'm here at least one guy um, who's also a Democrat who would tell you that in this particular case, big oil and gas has responded very, very well. They deserve a little pat on the back here. Dan Dicker, we appreciate you coming back to give us some more context on all this. Thank you very much. Okay, Josh. Let's stay on the topic of the economy and Ukraine with our next guest. Natalie Jaresko is Ukraine's former Minister of Finance and joins us now. Minister Jaresko, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Josh. What's your reaction to the measures that President Biden announced today regarding Russian energy supplies? I think this is a momentous step on the behalf of the United States and extraordinarily important because Russian exports of energy and commodities are 40 percent of their income. And if we're going to stop this war and do it quickly, we have to cut off the supply of money that they generate from oil and gas. I, I know that this is important in part because one of the latest reports, and bear with me one moment while I pull it up, one of the latest sure. reports from Ukraine's military, their daily military update, says that one of their concerns in terms of what Russia will do, and again, I'm just trying to search through this as we speak, is basically to create some kind of a temporary fuel pipeline from Belarus down into Ukraine to resupply their forces. I know there's been a lot made of the humanitarian need, the military need, but just the pure economic need of this, Minister. It sounds like you support that as a way to kind of choke off this effort at the source. Well, I think that's a different issue. That's, a, that's an issue of supplying fuel to his troops because he never expected, it appears, for his troops to have to last this long in battle. He expected this to somehow be easier. And the Ukrainian armed forces have, and civilian defense force have given him such a run that he now needs more fuel. So I think you know, we're dealing with kind of different things. He needs to get fuel to his tanks. They're running out of gasoline. And um, we need to cut off the source of money that's earned by Russia uh, in the export. They export about $110 billion a year in crude oil alone. Five billion of that comes from the United States and as of today, not a dollar comes from the United States to finance that war, not from oil. I do actually, I, I, I appreciate you um, providing that clarification. Let me just clarify a little bit from the document. According to Ukraine's military update, they're saying that they are considering doing what you said in terms of tapping civilian gas stations for their need for gasoline. There's also another effort to try to create a network of field pipelines with the possibility of connecting to the central oil pipeline and pumping fuel from Belarus. So that's just to clarify the statement from the Ukrainian it's government. Yeah. Yep. Yes, yes, indeed. The, the European allies that have not joined the U.S. on this, I understand because they have a different relationship with Russian energy supplies than the United States does. But what's your, what's your sense of that? There had been this strong effort to keep everybody unified in everything up until now, and this seems to be kind of the one break in the armor, but how significant a break do you think it is? I don't think it's a break. I think that the EU's announced that they're going to try and uh, reduce the reliance on Russian imports this year by two-thirds and then move away completely by 2030. I think it just takes longer for them because they're much more reliant on the Russian supplies. There have been differences in our sanctions um, between the EU, the UK, and the United States all along. For example, the EU has sanctioned many more of the political elite in Russia than uh, the United States has. So each one is kind of doing the best that they can, trying to stay together to the extent possible. Right now, I'd, ar I'd argue that the Europeans need to come faster forward on the oil and gas. I would suggest Nord Stream 1 is the next big target. We've shut down Nord Stream 2, but we need to have our part all parties divest from Nord Stream 1. I should note that President Biden did remark on European dependence on Russian oil today. Here's part of what the president said. 
We're moving forward with this ban, understanding that many of our European allies and partners may not be in a position to join us. We're working closely with Europe and our partners to develop a long-term strategy to reduce their dependence on Russian energy as well. So that is one area where European nations may have different strategies, but another strategy we heard about just yesterday is a financing plan of loans, loan guarantees, and grants that was organized by the World Bank to the tune of $723 million in financing so far. What's your sense of the impact of that kind of financing on Ukraine's efforts? Well, I think it's really critically important. If you can imagine, the economy is at a full stop, right? The entire nation is practically speaking facing unemployment um, because the economy is being strangled, suffocated by troop by the Russian troops and the Russian invasion. Right now, the Ukrainians need this type of balance of payment support, and that World Bank, as well as uh, money, as well as the U.S. government, right now looking at uh, financial support for Ukraine, is going to be critical to keeping everything going and keeping uh, hard currency in the central bank to support the local currency. But it's nowhere near what's going to be needed to rebuild the country. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of damage being done. And that help is going to have to come not just from our Western partners, but we're going to have to see reparations from Russia that actually created all of this damage, that, that, that did all of this. The U.S. is also working in Congress on providing an aid package that at the moment looks like it's about $14 billion. As, I don't know if you heard me speaking to Peter Alexander earlier, but it started off as about $6.4 billion last week and has grown very quickly since then. Some of that funding may go through the State Department, some through the Defense Department, some through the U.S. Agency for International Development. What would you like to see in terms of just the economic aid in this package where the money should be spent, where the money should be prioritized? I think that we're looking at a situation where um, it really is in the interest of everyone to get as much of that money to uh, the humanitarian needs of Ukraine today and, frankly speaking, first and foremost, to the military needs of Ukraine. So whatever can be done right now, the maximization of resources to the air defense in Ukraine, if the United States and NATO are going to continue to say that there's no no-fly zone possible, then we have to use everything we've got to let the Ukrainians defend themselves. And that would be first and foremost, maximum support for the military effort, in particular air defense. Could I just ask you, since the, the push for a no-fly zone has only gotten stronger from Ukrainian leaders on the ground, including President Volodymyr Zelensky, who has continued to repeat that call, what do you think that would mean in the long term, in terms of Ukraine's efforts to rebuild? Suppose there was a no-fly zone, no fly zone. Suppose, you know, the U.S. and other nations got involved. It successfully repelled a Russian attack. It feels like the world leaders who are trying to get involved in Ukraine are trying to limit their involvement because there are long-term kind of downstream effects of that. To say nothing of what would happen if a U.S. fighter shot a Russian MiG and all of a sudden the U.S. and Russia are in a direct military conflict with each other. It sounds almost like making this a larger military conflict could complicate everything downstream depending on what happens in the interim. But how do you see it? Well, frankly speaking, I think that we can't continue to watch thousands of people be killed, civilians being shot in humanitarian corridors, bombs being lobbed at nuclear reactors, which could reach, if there's a nuclear accident, could reach Europe in any case. So my personal opinion is that we need to end the war as quickly as possible. And if a no-fly zone is possible and it ends this war more quickly, then that's what we need to do. If a no-fly zone is not possible, then we need to do everything else within our capacities. And we're not yet doing everything else. There are so many more things that we could be doing. And time is of the essence. I'm, I'm watching the video as, as, you, as, as I'm speaking and I'm, I'm barely able to keep talking. The destruction, it is, it's a scorched earth approach to destroying the Ukrainian people. It's, it's a genocide happening all over again. I should note, by the way, that there is some U.S. support for limited military engagement. There's a Quinnipiac poll that came out uh, just today that showed 79 percent support for a U.S. military response if Putin goes beyond Ukraine and attacks a NATO country. That's according to a Quinnipiac poll that's out today.
former Ukrainian finance minister Natalie Juresko. I appreciate you speaking with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Josh. We will continue our conversation on Ukraine with a live report from on the ground in Lviv, near the border with Poland. And we will hear how the UN is helping refugees there. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Ukrainians are at war with Russia, but they are fighting much more. Dehydration, food shortages, and meager supplies. Civilian casualties are rising in Ukraine among people fleeing for safety. Fair warning, some of the images in this next story could be hard for you to watch. With that said, from our partners at Sky News, security and defense editor Deborah Haynes has more. Ukrainian officials say this was a residential area until Russia's bombs dropped overnight. Now they hunt for survivors. The body of a woman found. It's unclear if she's alive or dead. This hell in the northeast city of Sumy is what families are desperate to flee. A humanitarian corridor did finally open here. Young and old scrambled to escape. Foreign students also caught up in this war. It's the first successful evacuation in Ukraine after three days of failed attempts. But there's no relief yet for other parts of the country. The city of Mariupol in the southeast is one of the worst impacted. These images from yesterday show how the turmoil is so extreme, bodies at times have been left uncollected in the street. We don't have electricity. We don't have anything to eat. We don't have medicine. We've got nothing. <laughs> These empty shelves, evidence of the crisis. Ukraine's president even said a child died of dehydration here. Buses did move in to take families out, but Ukraine later accused Russia of shelling the exit route. Seeking perhaps to boost morale, President Zelensky made a rare appearance outside in the capital. It's snowing. This is what spring looks like. The spring is similar to the war we experience. Spring is harsh, but everything will be fine. We will win. Russia has different ideas. Its defence ministry released these pictures of Russian gunships opening fire. Moscow says it's not targeting civilians, but the reality on the ground has prompted the fastest growing refugee crisis since the Second World War. The city of Lviv on Ukraine's border with Poland is a transit hub for those not forced to wait for evacuation corridors. Yulia and her three daughters are on the move from central Ukraine after her husband told them to flee. It was very difficult for me to leave because my mother, disabled grandmother and sister are there. My children can't sleep at night. They cry when they hear air raid sirens and that's why we decided it would be better for our children to leave. They plan to take shelter in Poland, where she hopes her children at least will find some peace. Deborah Haynes, Sky News, Lviv in western Ukraine. Let's continue now in Lviv, near the border with Poland, in western Ukraine, where there are people trying to seek shelter. And that is where we find NBC's Cal Perry joining us live. Cal, what are you hearing from some of the folks? What are they telling you about becoming refugees? Well, we're starting to get a better picture of the sort of horrors that are playing out in various Ukrainian cities that have been under siege now for five or six or sometimes seven days. We heard President Zelensky yesterday talk about a young girl who died in the city of Maripol. He said she died of dehydration. It's, it's an indication that it's not just the violence and the explosion that's now killing people. It's the situation around the country and the deteriorating conditions. And we've been trying to sort of put our finger on that moment where people decide they can no longer stay in their homes, that moment where people decide their only move is to leave. I had a chance to speak uh, today to a mother of one who, who fled from Kyiv, and I asked her, you know, what was it that finally put you over the line, that finally drove you away? Here's a little bit of her story. In the moment when we must go, uh, we said that uh, we can't uh, um, 
left our husbands uh, there uh, alone, so we, we must uh, be with uh, them. But when uh, we heard uh, some explosions, we decided that uh, the best way for our children to go out of uh, the war, maybe abroad, uh, best, best way, best chance. And Joshi, one of the hardest things uh, for families to deal with and to talk about is that separation, that forcible separation, having uh, to leave fathers and husbands behind to fight uh, while the families move on. It, it's something we're hearing time and time again about how hard it is to make that decision because families don't want to split up even as the violence uh, reaches their neighborhood, Joshua. With regard to that violence, Cal, just before we went on the air, we got an update from the UN's Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights stating that so far in this conflict, they have recorded more than 1,300 civilian casualties overall. That includes about 474 deaths and 861 injuries. 29 of those are children. And it notes that most of the civilian casualties were caused by the use of explosive weapons, including shelling from heavy artillery and multi-launch rocket systems and missile and airstrikes. Those are what are behind many of the civilian casualties here. Before I gotta let you go, Cal, we heard from President Zelensky today speaking to the British Parliament. And from what I understand, he got a very strong, very positive response to his words. Yeah, he's um, someone who has come into his own in this conflict. Um, he's somebody that is rallying this country together. He does these daily videos, these every morning videos, um, which started almost as proof of life videos, knowing that he was the top target um, for Putin, that he could be killed at any moment. Um, and they've quickly transformed uh, into these speeches that he's giving uh, to lawmakers around the world. He received a standing ovation, as you said, at the end of his speech to the British Parliament. We've got a little clip I think we can play uh, so that you get a better idea idea of what he said. We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight till the end at sea, in the air. We will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. Please make sure that our Ukrainian skies are safe. Please make sure that you do what needs to be done and what is stipulated by the greatness of your country. Best of all to Ukraine and uh, to the United Kingdom. I'm mentioning this because it's part of the story. Uh, he looks the part. Uh, I mean, people here have rallied around him because he looks the part. And he's also saying the things uh, that are rallying Ukraine together, that these people are fighting for their homes, that they're fighting for their freedom. And he always says that the Russians don't know what it is that they're fighting for. And that resonates here uh, as you continue to have this situation, as I said, where families are being separated. It is something that people are now starting to live by. It is a mantra here uh, that people are embracing. Thank you, Cal. Please do stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Cal Perry reporting from Western Ukraine in Lviv. Up next, we will hear from the United Nations on how it is helping millions of refugees from Ukraine. And later, it's International Women's Day. You'll see how people are marking this day across the globe just ahead. Stay close. The most heartbreaking part of this war may be the refugee crisis, and it keeps getting worse. An estimated two million refugees have fled Ukraine. That's according to the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees. That would make this the largest, fastest displacement of people in Europe since World War II. I just uh, left my home to nowhere. I have no plan. I just want to, to save my child. Can my mother have a little sister, dog? And father says that we must go to Poland because it's too dangerous to stay in Ukraine. My feeling is that uh, I'm afraid about tomorrow. I'm not afraid about now. What's what I'm afraid about tomorrow? What we have in Ukraine next? What's the next day? 
what's our future here? We have here our families, we have here our business, we have here all our life, it's, it's built it here. I'm living seven years in Ukraine, I have built a good life here, and now I don't know what's my future, what's tomorrow, what's going to happen. Joining us now is Chris Meltzer, the spokesman for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Mr. Meltzer, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I understand that you are in Poland, just west of Ukraine, helping with the evacuation efforts. What have you been seeing lately, and how is that effort going? It's actually the same pictures I'm, I'm seeing for 12 or 13 days now. Uh, many people are trying to, to flee. Um, so there are still long lines of cars on the, on the eight uh, border crossing points in Poland, and also a lot of people trying to, to walk to come just as, a, as pedestrians. It's freezing cold here, and um, today the border guard of Poland confirmed but what I thought that 90% of the refugees arriving here are women and children, and we from UNHCR, we try to help them as good as we can. Talk about the kinds of help that you're providing, especially because I imagine there are a lot of unaccompanied children who have basically arrived with the clothes on their backs. Yes, uh, indeed. Many refugees arrive exactly like that, probably a small bag or something, and uh, sometimes not, not, not even that. Um, here, indeed, also unaccompanied children, and UNICEF and, and us, we, we try to help these children. On the other hand, we, we focus our work to Ukraine itself. Um, UNHCR still has 120 um, employees, men and women there in Ukraine, and uh, uh, these brave men and women are helping the internal displaced persons in uh, in Ukraine every day by uh, providing um, some uh, relief items and also searching for accommodation. With regard to the effort to help, especially children, the executive director of UNICEF and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees released a statement asking for neighboring and impacted countries to ensure that unaccompanied and separated children are immediately identified and registered as they flee from Ukraine and also being allowed to access their territory. Mr. Meltzer, how is that going so far in terms of working with other countries around Ukraine to receive children? I can only speak uh, about Poland because I'm here in Poland and they're doing quite a good job actually. So um, the government of Poland is well prepared for, for a lot of situation, also for these uh, problem that they are children and they mean they are the, the most vulnerable um, of, the, of all the people who are arriving here when they are unaccompanied. Um, there are many partners like the Red Cross or churches and there are also um, many yeah, very ordinary people doing extraordinary things here in, in helping um, helping families, helping children to find um, accommodation or uh, in other things. So sometimes it's even the small gesture but, uh, that shows also the children that there's someone who cares for them. Because there are so many organizations involved in helping these refugees and also, as you mentioned, volunteers on the ground, just clarify for especially people who may not be as familiar with UNHCR what your organization's role is in the midst of all of this. Is it coordinating? Is it providing supplies, food, money, medicine? How does UNHCR fit into a larger effort like this? Well, we are for more than 70 years now the refugee organization, the refugee agency of the United Nations. We are working 130 countries, and sometimes, like in Poland, we have uh, we are not more coordinating, and we are also checking the borders, talking to border guards, and especially also to to refugees to see if the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention is upheld. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, for example, there we are, how we call it, operational. So uh, we are we try to provide for as many people as we can, and uh, that's what our colleagues are doing. And right here in Jezhov, where um, this is also a kind of of hub for um, relief items for uh, Ukraine. So planes are landing here and uh, we are sending every day um, trucks, convoys to Ukraine with urgently needed aid. There have been some reports over the last week or so of claims of racism at the border. The International Organization for Migration said that it had what it described as credible and verified information 
that, docu that documented discrimination against third country nationals arriving in neighboring countries. They also noted acts of xenophobia based on race, nationality, and ethnicity. What are you seeing and hearing with regard to that? And do you think anything is being done about that? UNHCR has heard about that the first time uh, one and a half weeks ago, and we investigated that immediately because that would be a breach of the of the 951 Refugee Convention, and both Poland and Ukraine had signed that. Um, we found out that indeed there were um, third country nationals uh, were were kept at the border for 12. 24, sometimes even 36 hours, and we confronted the border guards with that and the government and asked why that. They explained that these were people without documents, and that's why they needed to check the documents with the with the embassies of the home countries of these people. What is very important to us is that no one was sent back to Ukraine. No one was denied the entry in the safe place Poland. That would be another breach of the um, Refugee Convention, but uh, we have no indication that there were cases about that. Okay, so there were concerns about being let in, but no one was turned back, which is, which is good news. One more thing before I have to let you go with regards to Russia's role in all of this. There have been multiple efforts to create humanitarian corridors that would allow refugees to get out of Ukraine or also allow relief supplies and humanitarian aid to get in. What is your sense of where that stands right now? It seems like the efforts have been halting at best. Does that look like that's actually going to, to come to fruition? Well, we are still hopeful that we will have these kind of corridors. Unfortunately, experience shows that um, this is never really reliable, not, not, not in Ukraine, not in other countries. But we really need these corridors, as you said, to, to take civilians out and to take urgently needed aid into the country. And we can just underline again and again and again, civilians are not a target in a military conflict, period. But as an exclamation mark, um, this is so important and we only can underline that and stress that again and again. And in our last few seconds, sir, for people who are watching this around the world and wishing they could do something to help, what would you recommend? What's the best way for us to help? I would recommend, uh, of course, since I'm working here for UNHCR, um, our organization, America for UNHCR, uh, but there are, of course, also other great relief organizations. But indeed, uh, donate money is the, the easiest and most efficient way, efficient way to help. We really need this, uh, every aid, every support here to help these people. More than 2 million now in just 12 days, and many of them staying out there in freezing cold weather. And that's why, please help. Yeah, the site for USA for UNHCR, for those of you who aren't interested in checking it out, is unrefugees.org. Chris Meltzer is a spokesperson for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Mr. Meltzer, thank you very much. We will have more from Ukraine at the top of the hour right after this program. Lester Holt anchors a nightly news special report. Inside Ukraine is next here on NBC News Now. Some of today's other headlines are coming up, including the first trial of a January 6th defendant accused of attacking the U.S. Capitol. Also, Florida schools could soon curb their conversations of sexuality and gender, the latest on what critics call the Don't Say Gay bill. And President Biden is pushing to expand health care for veterans. Those stories when we come back. Our headlines begin with the push for justice after the January 6th insurrection. Today, a jury sentenced the first rioter to stand trial for the attack. Guy Reffitt was found guilty of all five counts. They included obstruction of an official proceeding and transporting a firearm in support of civil disorder. Mr. Reffitt traveled to Washington from Texas. Video shows him leading a mob up the steps of the U.S. Capitol. One big twist in this trial? his teenage son testified against him. He said that his father threatened him and his sister if they turned him in. Perhaps some of the strongest evidence against Guy Reffitt were his own words. He basically snitched on himself, making recordings, talking about his plans for January 6th. And then, after the riot, he talked about what he did. 
So far, more than 750 people have been arrested in connection with the insurrection. More than 200 have been sentenced. Refit will be sentenced sometime this year. In Florida, a bill to limit how schools discuss gender and sexuality could soon become law. Today, the state Senate passed the Parental Rights in Education bill. Critics call it the Don't Say Gay bill. The measure would restrict schools from prompting discussions about sexual orientation or gender identity. Students could bring it up themselves, but not their teachers. The bill prohibits instruction on these topics from kindergarten through third grade. Higher grades have some room for interpretation. Opponents of the bill included Democrat Chevron Jones. He is Florida's first openly gay black state senator. To those who think you can legislate gay people away, I'm sorry. You cannot. I think you should spend your time legislating to protect them. This bill passed along party lines 22 to 17. Now it heads to Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. He has expressed support for the bill in the past. President Biden is pushing for better health care for veterans. He was in Texas today, focusing on exposures to burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. Military bases there used burn pits to dispose of trash, batteries, even human waste. They were covered in fuel and set on fire. Now, these pits are toxic, but veterans have struggled to get treatment. Reason being, it's been difficult to prove what exactly caused their health complications. This issue is deeply personal for the president. His son, Bo, died of brain cancer after serving in Iraq. The cause of Bo Biden's cancer is unknown, but the president says he is committed to uncovering the effects of burn pits. Too many of them were not the same. Headaches, dizziness, numbness, dizziness, cancer. And we know, we don't know yet enough about the connection between burn pits and each of these diseases so many of our veterans are now facing. But I'm committed. I'm committed that America make the commitment to find out everything we can. President Biden is also calling on Congress to pass legislation dealing with burn pits. Bills are pending in the House and the Senate. People around the world gathered for International Women's Day. We'll have a look at how different countries celebrated and protested before we go. A plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan is the focus of a trial that's underway. Today, prosecutors began laying out their case against four defendants. Adam Fox, Barry Croft Jr., Daniel Harris, and Brandon Caserta are members of a paramilitary group called the Wolverine Watchmen. They face charges of kidnapping conspiracy accused in the threat against Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Now, the governor is hardly the only woman in office who's faced threats. Some experts say this trend is growing. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson has the story. The year 2020 brought a wave of women leaders to the highest levels of U.S. government. A record 149 women currently serving in the Congress, three women sitting on the Supreme Court, a fourth potentially by next term. And for the first time in U.S. history, a woman was sworn in as vice president. Madam Vice President, no president has ever said those words from this podium. But with the surge of women in power, experts say threats and attacks, both in person and online, surged too. Take Representative Ilhan Omar, one of the first two Muslim women to serve in Congress, who's gotten death threats from the public. Don't worry, there's queens that will love the opportunity to take you off the face of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, which tracks online disinformation, hate, and extremism, looked at online abuse targeting congressional candidates during the 2020 election and found female Democratic candidates were 10 times more likely to get abusive comments on Facebook than male Democratic candidates. Researchers say it could be because of a difference in party ideology. Um, whereas women in the Democratic Party really are seen as, you know, uh, pushing women's rights issues, pushing issues of racial justice. Um, and I think that really breaks with the status quo of power. Um, so I think it attracts a lot of hostility. And when former President Trump continued to push his lie of widespread voter fraud, which didn't exist in the 2020 election, some state level elections officials like Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold became targets for telling the truth. If you had threats to your 
family to yourself? Yes, uh, death threats for just doing my job, for protecting uh, Colorado elections and making sure that Republicans, Democrats, and independents have access. And experts say those threats are becoming more violent and more radical, pointing to the kidnapping plot of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer over COVID restrictions. When the group initially came together, whatever that orientation was initially, it switched to something far more sinister and far darker, and the size and scope of it was also unprecedented when looking at other types of militia threats uh, and anti-government threats in the United States. That's NBC's Hallie Jackson reporting. Now, threats like these reinforce the purpose behind International Women's Day. Today, people celebrated progress toward equity and demanded more changes. Here are some of our favorite pictures from events around the world. Those are some of today's images from International Women's Day. Hey, remember to keep sending us your questions and stories about the war in Ukraine. We're at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. The news continues with Lester Holt and a nightly news special report. Inside Ukraine is next on NBC News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.